Hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming and welcome. Uh, we're Friends Here Scotland. Uh, we campaign for a world where everyone can enjoy a healthy environment and a fair share of Earth's resources. And uh, we're putting on a series of climate testings across Scotland for a chance to drill the candidates about their positions on climate and more. Um, today we'll have speakers from Scottish Labour, Scottish Conservatives, Scottish Conservatives, Scottish Lib Dems, and the SNP. Um, we did invite a Scottish Green candidate, but they had to pull out at the last minute due to health concerns, and then they weren't able to find someone to fill in. Uh, <clears throat> we have membership leaflets, badges, stickers, and more outside, and you can sign up for our mailing list there. So please take some stuff, because I have to bring it all back otherwise. Um, We'll just run through the agenda for everybody today. We're going to have two minute openers from each of the candidates. Then I've got two set questions to kind of get the ball rolling that friends here wanted to ask. Um, again, candidates will have two minutes to answer these questions. Um, and then we're going to move to questions from the floor. There's two ways you can do questions from the floor. You can put your hand up, I'll call on you, you can ask a question. If you're not that comfortable, you know, public speaking frightens a lot of people, that's fine. You can also write a question down on a piece of paper. My colleague at the back, Stuart, has paper and he'll collect them from you. Uh, he'll give them to us and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, we only have two hours, we might not get through everything. And there will be a short break in the middle about eight o'clock. Uh, and then we'll close with closing statements from the candidates. And we'll finish at 9 p.m. on the dot. Uh, so yeah, thanks everybody. If you want a piece of paper and you would have one, just put your hand up uh, for now and we'll come to questions in a minute. We're gonna start with our opening question or opening statements and we'll start at this end, if you want. Two minutes. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, so I am Siobhan Patterson and I am standing in the upper praise for Labour and for Britta. Um, I'm standing as a Labour candidate because I align myself with their socialist principles which I think we all know that as environment suffers, we all suffer as a result, but specifically so those most, most vulnerable in the society um, that are going to be hit hardest. And I'm also with the cooperative party because I believe that the cooperative run model of people saying our community run projects are the route to help us get improved outcomes for environmental issues. Personally, I've always been a conscious consumer uh, but following the birth of my first daughter, I was absolutely crippled by eco-anxiety, um, which led to me taking the choice of becoming vegan for the environment. But I have slipped back into vegetarian because I got Don't judge me. It's hard. It's hard. I'll, I'll be back there. Um, I still acknowledge and I still believe that we all have personal responsibility to make choices that are the best for the environment, there's no getting away from that, but I've come to the realization that actually, I think the onus should be much more focused on the big corporations and the businesses and companies that are continuing to profit. So I'd like to see a lot more pressure on the system rather than the individuals, because I feel like a lot of the attention is focused on the individual, um, which resolves the corporations of their responsibility. So I'd love to see a shift on that. Oh, um, so I was just going to say that I've personally used my platform on social media to organise litter pickings and tree plant ins I've managed to plant 250 native trees and wildflowers on a piece that was previously scrubland. Um, and I think it's true that we need to act global, think global, act local, which is why I'm standing. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, move over to Sean here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sean McKay and I'm standing in the Karst Kinnaird and Trist Ward for the Scottish Liberal Democrats. After everything we've been through, Scotland needs new hope right now and at the coming council elections you will find that hope with the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Our councillors and candidates are thrilled by what community can mean. We see the best in people and we want the best for them and if we see something that isn't working then we try to fix it. It's time to move on from the divisive issues that have held us back for so long and focus on what really matters right now. And that starts with getting Scotland back on its feet after two years of the pandemic and recognising that people are facing their biggest squeeze in household budgets in a generation. We face so many challenges right now, not least among them the climate emergency, but also two years of disruption in our schools and longest ever waits for healthcare. So what are we going to do about it? 
Well, on the school's question, there are teachers out of work just now who want to be who want to work. Let's get them back into the classroom, cut class sizes, and boost support for pupils. We want to see new people in your local surgeries and get you the treatment that you need fast. And for the climate emergency, we want to insulate you and your homes from both the climate emergency and from the cost of living crisis. In Falkirk, there are 650 acres of vacant and derelict land. Let's put this land to better use. And if it can't be developed, then let's reinstate it, remediate it, and turn it into green spaces that can allow people and nature to thrive in. Scotland has a proud history and our people are magnificent. You can see that in the way people have responded to the war in Ukraine, for instance, opening their homes to refugees and supporting charities that help them, but it can do so much more. Our candidates and councillors are local champions. You won't just see us at election time. If you back us in May, then I promise you, in the towns and villages across Scotland and across the Falkirk area, we will show you the meaning of hope once again. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm James Bundy and I'm the Scottish Conservative candidate for Falkirk North. Uh, I currently work for Stephen Kerr. Uh, so I currently work for Stephen Kerr, MSP, uh, who's one of the Scottish Conservative MSPs for Central Scotland. And one of the first things that I did whilst working in his office was commission a report with two individuals, Rachel Nunn and Andrew Falk, uh, to look at how Scotland's local authorities are dealing with the climate crisis that's facing us. And the Falkirk Council plan wasn't out then, but I've now looked at it. And scope one, scope two, which is the direct control of the council. Falkirk Council is doing a pretty good job in, but scope three is hardly mentioned in the report. And these are the areas where there's indirect control, but Falkirk Council is still responsible. So I think anyone who's re elected, regardless of party, has to start addressing uh, this scope three. And that's why the Falkirk Conservatives are backing an ambitious active travel network in Falkirk, connecting our key tourist sites, the Kelpies, the Wheel, Calendar Park and House, as well as the High Street, where we need to get people getting around Falkirk with ease if it's walking, cycling, or electronic bikes. And we also have to retrofit buildings, in particular in the high street. And whilst it will be expensive, I think Falkirk Council should be ambitious and um, say in what ways can we retrofit the high street and potentially have a net zero high street. I think that would be a wonderful selling point for Falkirk to get tourists in, but also just for uh, consumers and for local business. And Whilst we have to be bold, what we all should have a uh, reach out to businesses as well. We do have Enios in our local authority, who is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, contributor to carbon emissions. So why don't we reach out to Enios and see if they would be happy to invest in this net zero project to, to offset some carbon emissions? So obviously that means working with big business, being bold, uh, but it's something that we should be doing. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm uh, Laura Murta, and I have, have been a councillor for the, the last five years in the ward of Karsk, Kinnaird and Trist, um, and uh, standing again as, as one half of an SNP team with my erstwhile ward partner, Gary Bowes. But I think here, you know, we're, we're here to represent um, our teams, our administration, uh, for me, it's the SNP administration. And it's not just about what us individually would do, as I, I know that, um, you know, like many others in this hall, I, I feel I do everything I, I can to try to be as good a, an ethical consumer, uh, you know, put forward policies myself. But what it, I think that all of us have a responsibility to do is not just look at the environmental easy policies, if you like, it's about every single policy that we have and what we do um, being an environmental policy. Um, one of the things which was very clear over the last five years is that I think when we're coming in, seeing the way that people silo work, seeing the way that an education decision is an education decision, um, a town centre regeneration decision is a town centre regeneration decision, or business or economy. And yes, there are some really huge issues in terms of the environmental aspect that we need to get to grips with waste, transport, a just transition, obviously um, how we insulate our homes, how we retrofit our homes, how we build new um, energy efficient homes. But it's got to be a lot more than that. It's got to be in each and every single decision at the smallest level to the highest, at the least obvious environmental impact to the biggest. And that's why our administration brought forward proposals to make sure that every single report 
that comes to Falkirk Council that goes to committee has not just buried at the back somewhere an environmental target. It has it front and centre so that every decision that we make is at the start. It looks at the climate impact, where we are against climate change, looks at carbon budgeting, but fundamentally also means that experts in climate change are there at the table for us to ask questions on, so that not just the environmentalists, but every single member of the council is aware of the environmental implications that we take forward and make those decisions. Uh, thank you, candidates. Um, I should have also mentioned that we're live streaming this, so welcome to our live stream audience, and we'll take some questions from them at some point as well. Uh, I'm going to move to the first of our set questions, which is quite broad. Um, transport is one of is, is the biggest member in the of emissions in Scotland. Uh, what will your party do to support active travel measures across Scotland? I'm going to start with Sean. Thank you, Malachi. Um, I think the big things that we need to that we're we're looking at uh, to support active travel in Falkirk um, is committing resources towards tackling chronically poor condition of uh, roads, uh, pavements, and cycle paths, making them safer for walking, wheeling, cycling, um, as well as as well as driving. It's one of the things I've seen where I've uh, where I've moved here from, and I've seen it here, I've seen it around here as well. That it's not just enough to build a cycle path; um, it's it's about maintaining it as well. After a few years, they get the same problems that you do on the roads. You get potholes. And then you get overgrowing vegetation from the side, from the verges and the sides. And if these things aren't looked after, then people aren't going to aren't going to use them. They're not going to be safe for people to use. So that needs to be that needs to be focused on. Um, we've elsewhere in council, you had Liberal Democrats standing on. You've had um, you've we've moved to declutter the streets to assist people who are both visually impaired, impaired and uh, wheelchair users makes the pavements easier for them to use and to navigate. Um, and we have, we want to develop a safe route strategy and incorporate modern streetscape design as well to separate, create separate spaces for cyclists, walkers, and for motorists, keep them all safe and separate and make it a more attractive alternative for people to, uh, for people to, uh, to walk and uh, walk and cycle in. And I would also just say as well, with um, so many new developments, I live in Canaird's up at the um, up at the back of Larbert, just moved into one of the new houses up there. Um, that it needs to be that that needs to be considered in the design of these places as well. It needs to be considered about how they are connected into the rest of uh, the rest of the Falkirk area, so that you have safe routes from these new places, not just within them but between them as well. Thank you, um, James. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying in my opening statement, the Falkirk Conservatives do back an ambitious active travel network around Falkirk and connecting the tourist site and also connecting uh, houses to this active travel network as well. Uh, and that would be um, walking, cycling, electronic bikes. Uh, it would be exciting uh, for tourists so they can go and see more than one tourist site and they don't have to drive their car everywhere. Uh, but importantly, it would get businesses uh, local businesses in the town centre, foot traffic as well. We know that there's a lack of parking uh, on the high street and a lot of people decide to park at the retail park, but if there was easy access by foot or by bike into the high street, uh, that would be uh, great for local businesses. Uh, and, and the folk at Conservatives as well, uh, with the research that I uh, mean, uh, Rachel and Andrew did, we've looked at what all other local authorities in Scotland are proposing, and there's some very exciting projects. And uh, me, myself, personally, I uh, lived in St Andrews for four years when I studied there. And you can see the active travel network there with uh, the beach, the golf course, uh, and their um, high street. And we should be replicating uh, what these places are doing and adapting it uh, for the conditions in Falkirk. And that means uh, working with communities, working with new build areas, in Kinnaird and expanding this over time so that every part of Falkirk uh, and every uh, ward is connected uh, to this active travel network and then expanding it uh, to the Fourth Valley region and so on. Thank you. Uh, Laura? Thank you. So active travel, I mean, it, it's something which I've lived and breathed for a long time and I've sat on the Regional Transport Partnership as a board member for the last five years and, you know, building that into both our regional transport strategy and um, local strategies. One of the last meetings I did at Falkirk Council, in fact, was on inputting exactly on um, how we have a local 
uh, active travel strategy that integrates into not just how do we get people from localities to main centres, which is very important, but also the concept about 20 minute neighbourhoods, which is a really important um, you know, SNP policy as the government policy that we've been trying to develop. It's about understanding that if you make people feel more confident and give access to services locally, people get more used to coming out, they get more used to walking in the environment. Um, and it's, so it's not just about saying, OK, yes, we have an initiative, which I think is fantastic about giving free bikes to uh, youngsters who can't afford and making sure every child has access to, um, you know, from an early age uh, cycles and building confidence. It's about creating communities, creating green spaces. And local councils have got a lot of power in which to do that, to create within our environments, to create our local communities and have our local communities take ownership through community empowerment in seeing you know, what they want to have in their in their spaces. So some of the even the things of you know putting our putting your money where your mouth is in my own ward. Um, during the pandemic, I championed uh, two particular um, roads where we completely closed them to traffic to say, right, let's let's make this. It's not just saying here the priority is pedestrians. Here is the only put, the only access is for pedestrians and cyclists and active travel. Give that message that this is a normal thing to do. It's a normal way to access your services and your environment and give people the confidence to be going out um, and to be accessing the environment so that we can not just connect with the wider community, but connect with inner communities and get people uh, seeing that as a normal mode of travel. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as the rest of the panel said, obviously it takes investment <clears throat> and maintenance as well. I would be massively concerned that of the safety, you would need to make sure they're well lit, monitored as well, because a lot of women specifically and young people might not want to use active travel for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, at the planning process, it has to be a climate friendly planning when you're thinking about building new estates, building new venues or wherever it may be. Um, but to actively encourage people as well, we've got so many resources in the Falkirk area, like the Helix, like the KLPs, we've got all these cycle paths, we could be encouraging and holding events to get people excited and engaged with active travel as well. But I know that for all active travel is not a possibility. I live in the Upper Braes. I don't know if anybody's hiked up the Upper Braes recently, but it's not so easy. And people with mobility issues or constraints might not be able to do that. So I think we also need to tie it in with locally run transport that's run for the people, not for big businesses as well, making it safe and reliable and accessible. So I think, yes, we need to be promoting active travel, but we also need to keep an eye on other environmentally friendly modes of transport and ideally be moving towards um, like an electric fleet of buses as well, hopefully in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Ready everybody, I'll move to our second set of question. Um, any of us came up in the statements. Um, any of us are pushing for fracking to restart to increase gas supplies. And the UK government has expressed their support of fracking, including in Falkirk. Um, how will your party oppose this? Start with? Oh, well, as you said, the UK government uh, is uh, supporting it on an evidence based basis. But uh, I approach uh, this question as with all uh, political questions that it must start with the local and the local people must have their voices heard. And uh, me personally, I would be uh, supporting campaigns that um, are campaigning against fracking starting in the Falkirk area. I personally don't think it is a sustainable energy model. And I think it would be more wise to invest our money in renewable energy and uh, small nuclear modular energy. Uh, so, yeah, personally speaking, uh, I think local voices de definitely must be heard and internally within the party, I'll definitely be pushing uh, for legislation in Westminster to, to make sure that local voices and local uh, pushback is heard and that local people are heard before um, big business. Uh, I think uh, people should be seen as sovereign over the local area uh, rather than uh, big businesses trying to make profit 
Uh, that's at the heart of my politics. Uh, and I know not all members of my party of that persuasion, but that's uh, where I stand uh, on fracking and uh, policies overall. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't, I suppose, take two minutes to answer the question. It's just kind of a straight no, um, absolutely not supportive of uh, fracking. And it wouldn't matter whether that was locally within Falkirk or, um, you know, up the road anywhere else. It, it, in the same way that whether we get, uh, you know, I don't, we don't have control over it in Falkirk Council, whether they go into Campbell Oil Field or Jack, or it doesn't matter, um, you know, where it is, if they can, you know, we're, if they're consuming the effect on the planet, the planet doesn't care. And yes, local voices are extraordinarily important in all planning decisions, but fundamentally in the principle of it, um, you know, we need to be focusing all our policies on reducing um, our reliance on fossil fuels. It's not an answer to just diversify into different fossil fuels. Um, we have to be looking at the alternatives and our focus has to be on that. And if we start to get distracted um, in that vein, then that's not going to be helpful to anyone. So absolutely, um, you know, a lot of the things that were said, both about in previous times of active travel and what's being said about, you know, we need to partner with, with our, uh, you know, with any of us or with um, those in industry and range mouth. We are already doing that. You know, our growth deal that we've put forward in Falkirk Council that's been agreed is already doing that. We're already investing £10 million into carbon capture technology. We're already investing with Alexander Dennis into green bus technology. These things are already happening. They're already important. Just in the same way, they're already investing in segregated cycleways and active travel and all these wonderful, um, you know, tourist investments. Um, these things need to, to continue, but we cannot be distracted um, by... You know the, the sort of you know national blustering that's going on down in Westminster. We need to be clear and focused and move forward um, to make sure that our ambition and our targets are matched with our action and the way that we do things and policies. We need to be clear about fracking um, and not give any room uh, for for any ambiguity on that at all. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, yeah, so we all know that fracking is no good. Um, and I love James's sentiment about that the local people need to be listened to. But I think it's been evidence that any of us have zero interest in what the locals have to say. And that's been an example in the closure of Bone Road when the locals were up in arms about it and zero credits was given to them. Um, so, yeah, I would not be supporting fracking. Um, and I think that the best thing to do to combat that is to offer a viable alternative because even where we move and reject fracking, then we could be in a situation down the line where we're then buying back gas from other countries who have allowed it. So I think the best thing to do to combat it and make sure that we're not just tapping into more fossil fuels would be to make sure that we have reliable, renewable energy as an alternative to offer people. I think one of the big arguments against fracking, and it's the same goes for the uh, Campbell oil field as well, is that these are not going to solve our short term energy problems. I work in the renewable energy industry, so my position on fracking is pretty clear, leave, like leave the oil and gas in the ground. But I'm dealing with a wind farm just now, planning consent. And yet it's still not going to be up and running because of the time it takes to actually put one in these kind of projects. It's not actually going to be up and running until the end of 2025. It'll be the same with uh, Campbell and it will be the same with fracking projects. It will take that long to get it through planning. It'll take it that long to get it through, um, to get it through all the consultative process and to actually implement this, that by the time that these things come online, the, the present crisis is going to have passed and we'll be extracting oil and gas from the ground that we absolutely do not want to be uh, we do not want to be using by that point we want to have moved on to other forms of energy we want to have we want to have implemented the green uh, the green energy revolution by then we have the labor and the scottish liberal democrats passed a motion to tighten scotland's uh, carbon reduction targets to a 75 percent reduction by 2030 this needs to happen in the next five years we can't be we cannot be supporting uh we cannot be supporting uh fracking or further oil extraction and we I think we need to work through a planning system uh, and just being supporting alternatives as other candidates have been saying uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen 
Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Um, I hope I kind of got the ball rolling. We're going to move to questions now. As I mentioned, there's two ways to do questions. So we'll have hands, and if you don't want to speak, um, get a piece of paper from one of my colleagues, and you can write it down. Give it to me, and I'll read it out. And I think we have a real green mic. I'm going to start with this one, though, because it comes from one of our friends, Lewis Falker, uh, comrades, companions, however you want to put it. It says here, um, Falker pension scheme still has large investments in oil and gas companies. I do not believe that engagement, as they spoke, works. What will you do to make divestment from fossil fuels happen? I'm starting with Laura this time. There's a pattern and who starts. So okay. <laughs> Laura, let's make it run. Right. Yep. I mean, it's, it's interesting you should ask that question because, uh, you know, our administration, I just see our environment portfolio holder uh, walk in the door, uh, Paul Garner, who, you know, we brought that forward um, as a proposal and we were very passionate and we had very passionate debates within our uh, within council and group. And, and one of the things that I find, you know, we, when we brought that forward, um, you know, the, the, the arguments that are being put forward about, you know, how, oh, well, if we do that, you know, what, what are the, the, the counter, what's going to be the economic impact and what, you know, um, and, and the process that we had to go through. Um, and, you know, the, even just debating it at our full council, I remember, you know, I felt very passionately that I wanted to be part of that debate and was prevented from doing so because it wasn't allowed to be debated in the diversity of the chamber. It had to go to the executive, which I'm going to be fair, and I know Joan was on the executive here, was not the most diverse of um, bodies in which perhaps some of the younger voices in, in, the, in the council could, could take part in. And that, that in itself, that stifling of debate, um, that inability for, you know, what was a really important, specifically given the cost of living crisis that we're dealing with at the moment and in addition WASPY women who are already dealing with a shortfall in their pensions that they were expecting so to sever ties immediately I think um, you're losing sight of many vulnerable people who will be affected by that of course Personally, I believe that we should no longer be investing in them and we should be investing in new renewable energy sources that will with time become more valuable within themselves. So I think moving forward, the emerging sectors is where we should be focusing our funds. Um, and on a side note, um, the Falkirk Labour Party have also issued a youth manifesto and we would identify a specific young person's champion which means that we'd be consulting and involving young people in every level of decision making within the council. So I think giving them that platform as well, where young people can have their voices heard and listened to, I think is the best course of action moving forward. John? Yes, it's an interesting question. Um, and I have to be honest, and I don't actually know how much influence that uh, councillors have over the uh, way that the council's um, pension funds are actually invested. Um, if there is a say in it, then absolutely I support um, I support divestment. Um, one other option might be, and this is just off the top of my head, but one other option might be um, for, I don't know if this is a possibility, something I'd be happy to look into, but whether it would be possible for councils to pay into um, support people to self-invest their pensions. Um, this, is, uh, this is an option that gives you greater control over what you put your, uh, put your funds into so that people who do want to put their funds into uh, ESG, um, environmental social governance, uh, governance funds um, that support good causes and do not have uh, oil companies, uh, arms, arms traders in their portfolios um, I think people should be supported to do that. So whether it's a case of actually um, just providing them guidance on that or actually um, even paying their employers' contributions into those pensions rather than into the, Falkirk Council, uh, into the official Falkirk Council scheme, um, it, it might be a possibility. It's something I'd be happy to have a look at. Thank you. James? Um, so um, when I go about my purchasing, I always take um, ethics into account. So I will look at um, supply chains and uh, who's funding the business and so on before purchasing. And I think the same principle should uh, apply when we're talking about uh, pensions. Uh, similarly, up with uh, Sean, I don't know the full details of how uh, the council influences or decides uh, what's being invested into what. Uh, but I do think... Um, the idea of giving people more freedom, more choice about where 
uh, they put their pension into would be a very good um, idea. And yes, whilst uh, we wish that uh, we could disinvest uh, from unethical businesses straight away, and there is the economic impact um, that was uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so this has to be uh, a priority um, for, for those in charge of the pensions. Um, but it, it will be uh, a process, uh, but I, I would support that process in, in the way that comes as kind to, to disinvest and go into more um, ethical, long-term, sustainable businesses. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to have to take some questions for us. I'll warm my other hand up right away, so she can start. Yeah. There's a microphone if you want to raise. <laughs> about back to travel it's food but it's jargon if you live in slamanan and you want to get a job that starts eight o'clock in the morning you're not going to get that job but a young person wants to go out on saturday night i'm asking out on saturday night i think young people should be able to do that you might get out you're not going to get back so there's an issue it's over like talking about the best and whatever i wonder if the plan will be built to mirror examples elsewhere where bus services are under public ownership not funded Funding private sector organisations to provide a flat yard service, but the council some support and flint forward to own their bus service and not bus service belongs to people, and that makes a difference. Thank you. Um, yeah, Minister Bay. Municipal bus ownership is something that friends are Scotland have been campaigning for, and you can flip that side right now if you want. Yeah. Um, we'll start with Siobhan. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree um, and I know not massively so so of course the bus service um, and the Labour Party do want to use the powers that brought in in 2019 to bring local transport back and a public run for the people and make it work especially with so many villages and outlying areas as it stands the bus routes the bus times it's not accessible or flexible enough for people to really use it as a viable option. Um, and yeah, there's it has been examples in other areas and there are campaigns in Glasgow that you also need to interlink um, different modes as well. So making sure that the buses are picking up at the same time as the trains are dropping off, making sure that there's staff on board that allow people to feel safe and comfortable using the services as well. So I wholeheartedly think that public transport should be brought back and for the benefit of the public. No brainer. Thank you. I think from my side, um, it's less about ownership and more about whether it is actually delivering. And But I can tell you that the existing model is not working and it's not delivering. I think we would definitely agree on that. Um, confession time, I, I actually, um, I had, probably not something to admit to a Friends of the Earth event, but I did drive here tonight. The reason I did that is because it is a 15 minute walk to my bus stop and a 10 minute drive into town. So it just made more sense, unfortunately. Um, so there needs to be greater, better coordination of where the bus services are run. And they need to go where they are actually serving their communities, not where they make their operators the most profit. And that's why the Scottish Liberal Democrats are campaigning for new local powers to integrate not just buses, but all forms of local, uh, all forms of public transport, and to control, give communities a say over how their local bus services are actually being run, uh, ending the deregulation brought in under Margaret Thatcher, so that services suit passengers rather than the bus company's owners. I think, sorry, I think just to sort of clarify on that. So I think private, as terms of ownership, I think private ownership can work under those circumstances. I think that has to be tried first, but if, if, a, if a publicly owned bus service is the way to get, to get people the service that they need, then that is the right way to, then if that's the right way to do it, then that's what, then that should be done. Thank you, James. So I um, agree with Sean that um, the, my focus would be on the provision. And that means not ruling out um, public ownership, um, but looking at all the options available, um, the current model isn't working in Falkirk. Um, I also drove here tonight, uh, again, for the exact same reason that um, the public transport's not connected at all. Um, but when I lived in London for a year, I didn't use a car once. Um, and that was because everything was connected. You could walk a minute to the bus stop or the tube and you were uh, getting anywhere pretty quickly. And whilst uh, not advocating an underground in Falkirk, we should be 
ambitious in shaping um, the public transport around where people use the service, again, not um, where the bus companies uh, go to make profit. So again, at the heart of my and the Falkirk Conservative vision for Falkirk is to empower the people of Falkirk, and that means making it easier for people to get around Falkirk and yeah, changing how the buses operate and how they're provided is going to be at the heart of that. Thank you. And obviously, and it was mentioned that you know the powers are being brought in by the Scottish government in order to enable local uh, communities and local government to be able to look at running their bus services. And you can see, obviously, the the um, mode of, uh, if you like, not to pun intended, of, of um, travel and transport in terms of bringing ScotRail back into public ownership and very much um, where our, our ethos is on that. But transport and bus provision, it's, it's part, it's not just simply about saying, okay, you bring the buses back into ownership or you, you, you have a private model this way or whatever. It's a multifaceted thing, as I mentioned before, about 20 minute neighbourhoods and about uh, having a, a change in mindset about how people access services. And that means councils investing within communities to make sure that the services are there that people can access locally. But also, and it's within our manifesto, the recognition that sometimes car journeys are necessary, whether that's to come to a hustings or not. Um, but what else, what, when you are then making those necessary car journeys and um, what is it that around the rest or around the peripheral how you can make those in the most environmentally friendly way for example having the strategy about um the uh, defossilization if you like or uh, of cars or, or transport whether it's the investment we've got as I mentioned with alexander dennis to try to look at a more uh, sustainable bus network in the first place and look at that technology. But I also drove, drove here today. Um, I drove here though in my electric car, um, which is the first new car I've ever had in my entire life. And I could only afford it, even on a councillor salary, I could only afford it because of the grant that was given to me by the Scottish Government. I charged it with my solar panels and the grant that was given to me when it was sunny earlier with the Scottish Government. I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to get an e-bike if it wasn't for the scheme that was given. So these areas of public policy are also really important to enable us to say, okay, when the car is necessary, do we have the network? We've invested to Falkirk to have the electric A9, um, you know, do we are investing in doubling the amount of um, charging points and putting them out in the community. It's not just about saying, yes, we need to have our bus network. My daughter who's sitting in the audience today got her bus pass today. Um, it's about all these things, making public transport more available, safer, cleaner, greener, but also meaning we can access things within the community without having to drive as well. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to wait in the mic? Yeah. Well, they won't need that. Well, loud voice. <laughs> I hear, but decent voice. Yeah, I worked in the oil and gas for 35 years. And, um, um, I'm a keen cyclist and ultra runner, use public transport all the time. And really the main reason that I'm here is to find out what's getting said about the stop car role and the, the new fields, um, the exploration of it. I know, I know the industry really well as regards to our fracking chart earlier on, we do frack in Scotland uh, in, in the oil fields. Um, it's not create energy. It takes a lot of energy to get the gas out. It's, it's all about money. And uh, uh, my question is to all of them, the, the, the new fields, the, the Campbell and the Jackdaw, we all know the way that the climate emergency is just now, it's frightening. And um, we cannot have these new fields. The United Nations General Secretary has said it's criminal action by the government, any government, have these new fields. So I know this is a council election and this is a, a global issue. But uh, yeah, I'd just like to hear the opinion, especially often I'll give credit where it's due, the Conservative councillor takes a bit of balls to <laughs> come to friends of the year, considering some of the stuff that Mr. Johnston's done and said. Thank you. Um, well, we started with Siobhan last time, didn't we? So Yes, we're starting with you, yeah. Sean. Oh, right, okay, yeah. that's fine. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I, firstly, I don't think we, I don't think we need to make distinctions between, when it comes to the climate emergency, I don't think we necessarily need to make much of a distinction between the local issues and the global issues. I think it's very much, uh, it's very much linked and, um, you know, it's worth, it's worth, worth us be, saying what, saying what we think on it, for the same that goes for all of us. 
Um, as far as Campbell go, uh, goes, um, I've already said I am 100% against um, the exploration and uh, exploitation of the uh, of of that field and uh, and any other new ones that uh, that may be under consideration. Um, like I say, by the time these these things come online, um, the present crisis is going to have passed. Uh, the need will have passed, and provided that the uh, and, and the focus needs to be on implementing. Uh, in, in implementing renewable energy across Scotland. Um, we had the recent round of Scotland, um, up to 25 gigaw uh, roughly 25 gigawatts of offshore uh, offshore winds. The, uh, we had the option of leasing round for that a few, uh, few months ago. And, uh, and I think it's, um, it's, been, it's, it's been terrific to see. And I think so that holds far more promise for solving our energy needs in the future. Uh, than uh, than extraction of um, extraction of more oil from the North Sea or fracking uh, fracking on land. Thank you. James. Uh, yeah. So the the UK government position is um, to support the Campbell oil field and um, the recent events with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, show that maybe we do have to have. A wee bit of pragmatism in the international politics um, of this. Um, if we do not have a reliable uh, energy source which we can go on to tomorrow, then we could be relying on Russian or Saudi Arabian oil and gas in even greater quantities. And uh, that's something that I do not want um, the UK to be doing. And we've seen how it's actually restricted. Uh, Germany's response in particular to, to Russia's invasion. But um, I believe that the response is to look forward and look to a sustainable solution. And I would um, personally support greater grants, greater investment from uh, governments, the UK and the Scottish government, uh, working together to get um, sustainable energy sources that are reliable uh, and bring these dates forward uh, if they possibly can. I think that would be greater for energy security, which brings back to the international uh, politics point, but I also think it's uh, the best solution uh, for the planet and uh, reaching net zero. Um, so that's what uh, my personal belief is. The UK government's taking a slightly um, different approach by saying that Campbell um, is the way forward. But yeah, there's a, the pragmatism there in the international politics, but I do think there has to be a slight change of approach to be more focused on the sustainable long term. Usually we let everyone have their, their time, but if you're going to be really quick. Yeah, no, um, yes, the Bonesh Road campaign was mentioned um, by Siobhan earlier, and yeah, I played a big active role in that campaign, so I'm very happy to stand up to Jim, Red, uh, Jim Radcliffe. Uh, and, and yes, as you were saying this, uh, a lot of oil and gas is imported uh, from the United States in particular, if they're fracking. Yeah, um, so that's why the UK government should be working with the Scottish government and other partners to look at sustainable energy here, getting more investment in that so it's reliable, so we can transition off rather than fuel. Let's move over to Laura then. Thanks. Thanks. So you're right. And the local council election, you know, I, I'm very much hoping to be returned next week, um, but I won't be able to stop the Campbell oil field or uh, Jackdaw or anywhere else. Um, but of course, I believe that it should be kept in the ground. And of course, I think there is, you know, it's a red herring to say that, you know, energy security, in order to have more energy security, we just need to pull more of it out of the ground. That's going to make our dependence even more reliant on fossil fuels. And we 
we are blessed, uh, it's often said we have won the lottery, the renewables lottery in Scotland. We, we have, you know, um, even our glorious sunshine does contribute to massive amounts of solar energy. Um, and I think that, you know, that has to be, if you don't have that focus, if you don't have that drive and say, okay, this is our, our targets need to be ambitious and we need to match the policies uh, towards that, you know, obviously I think everybody in our, in our party, 100% united that the oil stays in the ground. Um, but what I would say is that what we do have the opportunity to do in council is on the policies which actually make a difference within the local area. And those have a huge impact. We mentioned some of the, you know, the things about whether it's the, the heating systems themselves um, and, and we have, a, you know, uh, ambitious plans to build more more homes which are already uh, energy efficient and also retrofit and, and you know Falkirk Council already have plans to put in solar panels and, and insulate and put windows in but also you know we had an opportunity recently to put um ground source heating into an area in my ward in Lethem it would have been ideal for it and that decision wasn't made you know there was a the decision was made to, to then go down yes we hope that gas will, will be hydrogen ready and the technology but that's the move off but we had an opportunity it was ideal there to make a decision that was positive on the climate and it was missed and that greatly frustrates me and that's when i was saying earlier about what we when we brought forward myself our administration myself and councillor garner spoke on this to bring it forward to council to say every single decision that comes forward it needs to be clear it can't just be somewhere wishy-washy in the background that this is an environmental policy or this will have a benefit. Every single one, there's no hiding place and excuse. And that's why that's important because it can't stop Campbell, but every decision that we make adds to the impact that we can make at council. And that's what's critically important. We don't miss these chances. We've got no more time. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Um, yeah, it goes without saying, adamantly against the oil fields, but like Laura was saying, um, it is difficult to tackle those massive projects, but what we can do at a local level is lessen our reliance upon it. Um, I think there's a few ways that we can do that. Um, of course, utilising community grants so that communities can build and run their own projects it creates wealth within the community it creates jobs within the community so i think that's the best way forward as we move forward um north ayrshire labor council is an amazing example of what can be done when the local council invests into renewables and keeps the money within the community as well because not only are all their social houses run and fueled now by renewables, but they're running a profit. And I think over the 25-year the lifespan, they're actually going to generate way over a million pounds in profit that goes straight back into the community, which I just think is so ambitious, but achievable. It's being done. We can do it. So I think things like that I get really excited about, and it is something that's tangible, and it's something that's achievable, and it would take away our reliance on these big companies and what they're, because they're just running amok as it stands. Um, but I also think that you need to keep in mind, like there's a huge job market in Scotland for people who do work in the oil and gas industry. So I think at the same time, we need to be retrained, using that skilled workforce who have the knowledge and have the skill base and retraining so that some of those individuals can also be engaged and the and the shift as well um and i think also what we have at the moment obviously i'm not as informed as you about the state of things but i do know that the wind farms that we have um a lot of the jobs were outsourced like it's a lot of i think it was dutch individuals and i love the dutch but there's a lot of scottish workers who could have been employed in that area and also a lot of the energy that we're generating, I think I'm right in saying, is also exported. Why is it not getting kept at home? Thank you. What zero carbon jobs can be brought from the Grange mines to replace fossil fuel ones? And do you trust the Grange mines future energy board um, so uh, part of um, the UK government uh, strategy to go to net zero is a lot of uh, 
uh, retraining of jobs, particularly in the North East, uh, and it's tens of millions of pounds that's uh, being directly invested into that, and we are working with the Scottish Government uh, on that. Um, the specific jobs for Grange Mill, I'm not entirely sure, but it should be, and hopefully is, in the renewable energy um, sector. Um, Grange Mill uh, does have the history of being um, the industrial heartland, but in the 21st century, we should be bringing that forward to make it the heartland of renewable uh, energy. So I would um, support some of that money that's going to the northeast to be coming uh, into Grange Mill, into the Falkirk Council uh, to retrain jobs uh, here. And you know, I, I don't know exactly how um, the Grange Mill plant can be turned, um, but uh, those with expertise um, should be taking the lead uh, on that and working with the council, with the Scottish and UK government to adapt the, the, uh, the INEOS uh, premises and the other industries in Grangemouth as well. Uh, and I, I do think um, also that we should be focusing on local well-paid um, jobs and we shouldn't just be um, exporting jobs to where the cheapest uh, wages are. We should be getting well-paid jobs into Falkirk and doing that in a way which supports renewable, sustainable energy, uh, fits perfectly aligned with my political views. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. And as I mentioned earlier, um, of the, one of the I think, great successes of our administration over the last five years has been in the growth deal that we've uh, agreed. That yes, you can say it, it focuses around what will people see the industry in Grangemouth, but Grangemouth is a lot more than just uh, an area of industry. It's a community, it's a town that's, uh, you know, there for its, its people. Um, and it's about creating jobs, yes, um, not just creating jobs, but, you know, the partnership that we've developed with Gore Valley College um, and the focus on how do we upskill, how do we create the opportunities, how do we see the future industries and develop them here in Falkirk? And our, our partnership with the college has been a really important part of that. And I think, um, you know, we've only got, uh, I think, within our manifesto, so we've got uh, outline plans within that, the investment that we've got. But we do have specific plans in there to invest things, £10 million into the cabin capture technology uh, within Grange Mouse as well. And there's, there's a whole myriad you know, of everything. It's not just one thing or another. You need to look at how do you create the environment? Uh, how do we you know, look at the, the, the uh, outdoor parks? How do we connect it into the canal network? How do we not just see Grangemouth as being this, oh yeah, here's the industrial bit of Falkirk and it's the, the heartland on the end. We need to uh, involve the people of Grangemouth uh, in that community development, in those jobs um, and the whole of the district. Fal Grangemouth is incredibly important to all of Scotland, not just all of Falkirk district. Um, and we had a climate event recently just up the road um, where all our schools came uh, and talked said very insightful things about, about how they felt about climate and the, the kids that came from Grangemouth talked about that kind of how it felt to them um, being outside, how it felt to them having the, the, the power plant on its on its on a, on their doorstep and how they wanted to change the perception of their uh, town as well. So I think our our ambitions and our manifesto is very ambitious for, for Grangemouth, but integrating it with all the future technologies and specific proposals that we've got that takes us forward together and doesn't just annex it off as a side issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that question is a doozy, and I do not have specific answers um, on how we would make zero energy jobs specifically in Grangemouth, other than just to reiterate um, the fact that we have such a skilled, knowledgeable team of workers that are already in the industry and we should be supporting them and making it a viable and attractive option to retrain and invest in more renewable avenues. So that would be my only answer. Thank you. Um, Laura's already mentioned uh, carbon capture and storage, and uh, we need to be careful with this because it is one of those things that um, fossil fuel companies love to use as, uh, as a greenwashing thing that allows them to continue to uh, continue to emit. But being pragmatic in the short term, that is going to be part of the transition to uh, transition to net zero. Um, while the Liberal Democrats were in uh, coalition in Westminster, uh, we were uh, pushing hard on a um, carbon capture and storage project um, up in Peterhead, but Grangemouth would have been part of the uh, part of the network for that, um, bringing um, carbon up to uh, up to Peterhead from being pumped back out into the uh, back to back out to the North Sea, and I think that it could still have the potential to do that in the future. 
Hydrogen is another area I think uh, there could be potential for um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a carbon free future for, uh, for Grangemouth. Um, with the expansion in renewable energy generation, um, we know that sometimes the wind is blowing hard, uh, sometimes the sun's not shining. Hydrogen is actually a good way of um, putting surplus renewable energy to, uh, to use at a time when it's, gener when it's generating too much, for instance, if the wind's blowing hard overnight. Um, and a lot of the infrastructure between natural gas and hydrogen, it's not directly interchangeable, but it is adaptable. So you could, you could hypothetically, um, it, would, it, would be, it would be a huge project, I'm not going to deny that, but that could be something that could be looked at uh, for Grangemouth. Um, the other thing I would say as well is Grangemouth is one of the uh, main ports of entry in, the, uh, in Scotland for the delivery of wind turbine components. Now, I think um, it's one of the great tragedies that we do so much, uh, when we generate so much wind energy in Scotland, and yet the wind turbines are all built in Denmark or the Netherlands, um, Germany, and we, we import it. But that's that's where it is just now in the short term that will continue um but in the longer term i am um, I, I would love to see wind turbine components being built and assembled here in scotland um and if that could be done in grangemouth then that would be fantastic thank you thanks everybody and we're going to take a short break now by my watch it's um 58 we'll come back at five past eight and put seven minutes to soil it chat, think of some questions for these candidates, and then listen to others. And again, feel free to write down questions. People, I think my mic's gone up. I've got things in the back if you want to talk. Thank you. Thank you. So five minutes to...
Hope you all had an enjoyable break. Uh, I've asked a few questions that I had pre-written. So if anyone has questions from the floor, just stick a hand up and uh, we'll bring you a microphone. And if not, I got plenty of questions, so don't worry. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Oh, that's not on. This one, I think. There we go. Hiya. Um, so obviously, uh, climate change is not only a domestic issue, but it's also a commitment to the international community. Um, I come from a country where um, a lot of climate disasters happen all year uh, from the Philippines. And um, I migrated here when I was 13. So obviously, I grew up here. I, I knew what the consequences are when it comes to um, the devastation, the negativity. Uh, impacts of climate change. Um, so I just wanted to ask, what would your um, commitments be when it comes to encouraging climate justice? Because it's all well and fair when you ask individuals to change um, their behavior when it comes to sustainability. I've, I've worked in a climate change project and it's to encourage sewing or um, uh, dealing with a community fridge in order to reduce uh, supermarket surplus goods. And it's, it sounds great and everything, but at the same time, it's still not, um, you're not tackling the specific um, symptom of climate change itself. So again, I'm just gonna repeat, what would your commitments be to encourage climate change, uh, climate justice? Brilliant, thank you. Um... We started last time with James, I think. So we're starting with Laura. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So um, the motion that I, I mentioned that I brought to council um, as part of the administration uh, in November was about specifically about climate justice. And I know obviously in COP26, there was a particular focus, which was really important because it hadn't, I don't think really got the, the attention it deserved about, you know, everybody sees the right, okay, this is what's happening in this island nation, but it's, very, it's still very abstract. And until that comes home to people, you know, the, the decisions and actions that we individually make seem, you know, very particular to us locally, but they don't fade into the bigger picture. And that's why I think all policies, um, it is that, you know, what you do locally, uh, it, it's not that it's necessarily going to impact uh, down, down the road or next door to you, but it's going to have a huge impact elsewhere in the world and it will have a huge impact here too but um you know we see as human beings how if, if something isn't quite on our doorstep and affecting us it's easier for us to ignore so although as a council um it's difficult for us to then you know i, I brought this climate justice uh, you know motion forward so that we could speak about it so we could give focus to it so that we could it not so that it wasn't ignored and we were acknowledging it and that's important but what's more important from the point of view of being councillors to then say well what can we as a council do about it and, and how how can the actions which we take then impact on you know the very large actions you know we talked about as individual consumers I think this week is real nappy week and yeah you know great being um, a poor daughter sitting in, the, in the, the audience but you know having real nappies and real wipes and doing all those individual things is one thing but actually what we we did as a council to have carbon literacy training was understand what are the big huge decisions that we make on buildings, on, on waste, on transport, which will have the impact, not just here, but have the impact elsewhere in the world and make that link, be very explicit about that link. So, you know, um, as part of a to motion to bring that forward so that we could talk about it and make that link and, and make sure that, you know, as Scotland is a compassionate nation, we do think about others, that that's front and centre of what we're doing. It's not just for us. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a huge amount of insight, um, but you know, obviously we always have to keep in mind that we have a moral responsibility and be thinking about climate justice. Like Laura was saying, you know, we have to enable and support the individual, like what you're saying with cloth nappies, um, which is one example and a whole host of things that we can be doing, making sure infrastructure is there for the individual and make those choices, but also again, holding, corporations accountable, which I'm sure is out of our remit um, for local council, but, you know, putting that pressure on companies and corporations 
who are working across borders, you know, it impacts everybody. So rather than thinking about, you know, underdeveloped nations and as if it's far removed from us, it's actually a lot of these places have been overexploited by, dare I say, the British Empire or these corporations. So it's about providing, keeping that in mind at all times and keeping that moral responsibility at the forefront of your minds. Sean? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think it is, uh, it is a tricky one um, when we're working at such a local level. Um, I think we, um, or those, if we get elected as councillors, it needs to be in the, for, in, for, in the forefront of our thoughts when we're designing policies or taking votes or making decisions um, on environmental questions. We need to have a clear eye and a clear understanding of what is going on elsewhere in the world and the impact that these decisions have on people in places like the Philippines. Um, I don't really have anything specific um, other than a thought off the top of my head, um, whether we perhaps could look at reviving twinning, for instance, twinning towns. It seems to be something that, as Laura was saying there, it, it, unless these things are actually brought home to people, it doesn't actually, uh, it's hard for them to relate. These things feel, can feel very far away. And if you were to twin Falkirk or Larbus or Stenhouse Muir with towns in the Philippines um, or other parts of the world which are being severely impacted by the climate crisis, um, it might bring it home to more people, uh, the impact that these things are having, whether it's seeing the pollution from uh, marine litter, plastic waste, or if it's, uh, if it's seeing uh, the impact of typhoons and hurricanes that have become so much more powerful as a result of climate change. So um, that's, that, that's just off the top of my head, I'm afraid, but I think it's something we, we do need to think very clearly about in the, um, uh, if we get elected. Um, um, James? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I am a person of faith and um, the head of my church, Pope Francis, speaks a lot about moral trade and how when we uh, do trade around the world, it shouldn't just be looking at how it benefits our GDP alone, it should be looking at how it affects the most vulnerable people in the most vulnerable countries. And I believe that when the UK government is doing trade deals around the world, it should be people at the heart of it and communities. Uh, and I think um, ways to do this, not in the power of local government, but we should be exploring things like a carbon tax. Uh, so when people are uh, importing goods into this country, or if we are exporting um, goods, the carbon emissions are taken into account, and then these, uh, the money raised through that can be taken to invest uh, in developing nations uh, through the international development budget and the foreign Commonwealth office. Um, to, to give these countries the support for the, the environmental damage that has been done with our um, economic growth. Uh, and also some of that money being used, again, to invest in sustainable, renewable um, energy sources. And so I think, again, when it comes to uh, the developing world, we have to put morality at the forefront of Britain's approach. Thank you. So, sorry, did I bit come back in just on the thought there? Do I have time? Or... Uh, you had about 30 seconds left. Sorry, the, the, the thought that just cropped up as well is I think you know we also need to bear these issues in mind in, when it comes to council procurement as well. I think we need to think about kind of where, you know, what we're what we're buying and as a council to do our work, where it comes from, processes that have gone into uh, got into gone into making it. And you know, there's no sense in bringing in stuff from elsewhere in the world where um it's not been um we can't outsource our problems by importing in from abroad as well. So again, I think the the the, the impact that things that we import need to be taken into account as well. Thanks. Sorry. Okay, climate justice is a so hard for me to in terms of the Scotland and it's hugely important to every, everything. <laughs> um, I'm going to move to a written question I've got here. Uh, it's a little closer to home. This person says, we have an idea for a food forest, uh, but in, sorry, but in small upper Bray's community, there's not enough manpower to go forward uh, and handle funding. We're all struggling, juggling work, and most community projects seem to be forwarded by elderly, retired people, and um, people with not so many family or work commitments. How would the panel suggest smaller disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities take forward projects like this? Um, and we started with Laura. Laura. Thanks, first. 
<clears throat> yeah, I think community food projects should, uh, should be actively encouraged by the council. There should be support in place. Community grants should be made available um, and we should be doing everything we can because for so many reasons, of course, it cuts down on transport, it cuts down on costs, it promotes community engagement um, for well-being, for mental health. So this is something that should absolutely be happening. Um, we could certainly be looking at rolling it out. I know a lot of schools are doing little bits, um, but you know that's something that we should really be getting ingrained into the curriculum so that these young people coming up have the skill set and the knowledge that they can be carrying this back as well. Um, as well, if we were able to do, I know that there is um, something in the upper praise. Um, I think it's one parent family Scotland who are running projects, encouraging people to come along to events to, to give them the skills as well. But yeah, so I would suggest funding and education is the best way forward for promoting that. Thanks very much. Food forest, I, I love the sound of that actually. That, so, that does sound like a that sounds like a terrific idea. It's something that is actually in agriculture um, on, a, on a bigger scale. It's something that's been uh, been looked at quite a lot in terms of actually integrating forestry and woodlands into uh, into farms. So um, quite quite current from that perspective. Um, but it is an issue. You see so many parts of the uh, so many parts of the country where you've got voluntary organisations that are mainly driven by uh, people who are people who are elderly who have the will but, and the time, but you know not necessarily being able to do the some of the literal heavy lifting that comes into uh, that comes into projects like. Um, I think getting schools involved, terrific idea, um, because they, something like a food forest has uh, has the um, potential to be so educational. So I think something you know, stuff like that, and you know those kids who come in, you know, if they are if they can be inspired, it's more likely to make them to volunteer in their spare time as they um, as they grow, um, and um, if they and if they stay in the area, and we do want to keep kids in this area we don't want them disappearing off to edinburgh and glasgow and ne n never to come back and live here so we want to keep them uh, keep them here and hopefully they would stay involved in projects like this in the uh, um, in the longer term um, i think as well i think you know as a council you know we need to work with groups like this uh, who are keen to bring these pro uh, to bring in projects like this and um, i think we should kind of you know promote it as far as we can and um, yeah, just in, in, you know like Keep just making these things as visible as possible so that to give the uh, opportunity for people to um, come along and sign, sign up to help with them. Thanks, James. Uh, I agree. I think a food forest uh, is a wonderful idea. And again, it buys into the politics that I am all in favour of, which is empowering communities. Uh, I believe that uh, government there is is there to provide structure and I do think um, Falkirk Council, Scottish Government and the UK Government should be working together to provide um, structures which then allow uh, local communities to take the lead on exciting initiatives such as the food forest and to do that uh, we do need um, volunteers in the way to attract volunteers. Um, you cannot be motivated to do something if you don't know what it's about and the benefits of it. So increasing environmental literacy, and not just in school, but across all age demographics is, is very important. Uh, and that's then when once people start learning the benefits of growing your food locally and having food security at home, that should lead to a growth in volunteers from people from all ages uh, and then just on a general point uh, I think localized farming uh, is a fantastic idea which we should bring back uh, from generations past I think that um, the farming industry uh, the agriculture industry has got to the stage where it is big business big families in charge of the food stock uh, in this country and I think uh, breaking the, these uh, big businesses up and then getting it back into the community is the way forward. Thanks. Yeah, and it's, it's funny actually this question should, should come. I was actually meeting yesterday with representatives from my own community um, about establishing, a, a, you know, and they're looking at a community allotment uh, situation and there's various sites that they've been going around and we actually kind of went around some of them and we're talking about that. And 
I think when you say food forest, it, I get naturally excited about that uh, as, a, as a sort of permaculturist um, and uh, organic farming uh, enthusiast from you know, the, the point of view of um, the kind of farming that can be done in a different way from, from the kind of intensive agriculture. And um, we do have a, a really good community growing strategy and some of the projects which we've been working on with some of those in our community, um, in my own words, um, KLSLB, Keep Labyrinth Sense Here Beautiful, have a, a project which we are partnering up with local businesses, Karen Bathrooms and, and others, and Stimulus Move People Club Labyrinth High, all coming together to do community growing. And we're already doing those things. And one of the things which, I mean, you talk about the Scottish government and the UK government all working together. All of us need to be working together. Too often, when we have these sorts of projects and we bring them to council, small politics gets in the way. So. You know, we bring forward a biodiversity strategy, a growing strategy, a community growing, uh, and it's right. Well, we had quite ambitious plans to, to take forward, uh, you know, our biodiversity, and it's well. Wait a minute, let's not do all of that. Let's let's only do a small bit because people will get really, you know, they don't like it when you don't cut the grass, you know. Out of a light. So all these things they come into play on the on the kind of smaller level, and that stifles ambition. But it also, when the lines come in about, you know, we want the community to do the job which we won't pay for as the council, misses the point entirely. Our communities want to get involved. They want to be empowered. They want to tell us what it is that they need in our community and how we can invest better and that's what certainly I've been doing as a councillor what we're looking for in our strategies and what we're taking for and we're already doing um, but we do need to do more of it but all of us need to be working together to make sure that that's implemented without any local politics involved. Well it does tie in quite neatly to this other question I have here that goes, recently, Falkirk Council has been criticized for dysfunctional decision-making. Good ideas have been wrecked by party politics. Climate justice is complex and important. How do you work better with uh, other parties to make wise decisions? Uh, I started with Siobhan, I think, my friend, John. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, we are, so Liberal Democrats um, do not currently have any councillors on the um, on the local authority, so we've not been a part of that um, uh, that in the past, but I, I, the, I can see the temptation to indulge in point scoring. Uh, it's, it's, all too, it's all too easy to slip into that, uh, into that kind of, uh, that kind of thinking. Um, I think we all need to remember that we are all here, regardless of what party we're from, we are all here to make a difference and we're all here, we all want the best for people, you know, we're all here to do something positive and I think we need to focus on where there is common ground between us because we all want to represent our communities and do something positive for them. So I think we need to focus on what, uh, what it is that we have in common. There are legitimate differences, and um, I suspect some of what the question was asking about was the issue around the um, town centre regeneration um, and disagreements between Conservatives, Labour and the SNP on over how that should happen. Um, we shouldn't necessarily reflexively say, if, if you've got legitimate concerns, we shouldn't reflexively say you're just playing party politics. And again, that's, that's a temptation we you, you all too easily fall into sometimes. There just needs to be honest engagement with, with each other. And to try and find compromises that move these uh, move these things uh, move these things forward. Thanks, John. Uh, James. Yes, um, the comment about dysfunctional management. I believe that's a direct quote from Audit Scotland's uh, audit on um, Falkirk um, Council uh, and looking at um, the decision making in Falkirk Council over the past uh, couple of months, uh, in particular in the past couple of years, it's very clear to see why uh, that report came to that conclusion. Uh, and uh, I'm not um, advocating any um, responsibility from my party, um, but I am fresh blood, uh, fresh ideas. And tonight, uh, I think we've agreed on 95, if not more of the issues. So there is a common framework uh, here and there might be slight differences, but we should have that common framework and then negotiate from there the, the slight differences um, that we have. Uh, but I do think that it does go into the wider political debate in Scotland just now. Sadly, we are very divided 
um, over the constitutional question, but at local politics, that should be pushed aside because the interest of the people of Falkirk is what we're there to represent, not uh, constitutional um, politics. So it, my hope, uh, if I'm elected, is that all the parties will push that aside. I will certainly push it aside uh, and concentrate on the issues uh, mattering to the people of Falkirk, the regeneration of the town centre and active travel network, um, pension, disinvestment, and so much more. These are the issues that we are elected um, to discuss, not uh, independence or not. Yes, Laura. Thank you. I think one of the frustrations is that quite often we're sort of uh, told this uh, about, you know, uh, the constitutional question. Only people ever seem to bring up the independence uh, uh, word is the opposition uh, when it comes to um, what the SNP uh, want. When we're in local government, you know, we are focusing every day on the bread and butter um, of, of every decision that, that we're making that affects our local communities. And that's that's the basis of wanting the best for the people you represent, regardless of, of, of where you stand on other issues. Um, it has been frustrating, and I think, yes, the, the, the town centre issue has, has you know, it's soured and, and dominated some of the, 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 the discourse. Um, what's clear is after May the 5th, we all need to uh, move on into a new uh, spirit of cooperation that myself and actually my colleague Emma Russell, who's sitting in the audience, we brought forward um, a resolution about being towards a diverse and inclusive council. And that's not just about the people that sit around the table, that's about the tone of debate and the type of debate and the type of resolutions that come forward and the way that we do politics. And that, you know, um, we have an incredible array of experience uh, and have had been blessed with many experienced members, but there has to be um, also a balance and diversity where experience meets new ideas and, and meets new ways of working. Um, recently, I led a what we call a policy development panel, um, which was on all things taxi licensing, but it meant that um, people from all parties, from, from all the parties came forward and I chaired it. And the, the spirit in which I chaired it was to make sure that the way that we develop policy was consensual, was discursive, was investigative. Um, and then when it came to bringing forward the proposals, That's I didn't ask one of my colleagues to do that. I asked one of the opposition members to bring that forward and second that, because that's the way that we can do business together. We can work together, we can investigate things and we can move things forward. So I think that's that's the commitment that I feel I've already demonstrated and my party demonstrated, but something we need to move forward and get better with too. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet tonight. So I've been really enthused by this panel. I mean, obviously we're all like-minded individuals, despite whatever political differences there are. So I think that's really positive to take away from tonight. Um, I think, yeah, there's so many new candidates coming through. I think there's so many young candidates coming through as well. So it is, there is a movement of change happening within Falkirk politics, which I think can only be a positive thing. Um, and I think specifically on this topic, there has been a, you know, during the pandemic, people had time to reflect on what was important and where they wanted things to go. And I think that is more, even more so of a focus on the climate emergency. I certainly hope so anyway. So I think that it's one topic that we can all agree on. I can't see how there could be any discourse we're all striving for the same goal. So I think that's something really positive that across the board we can all be working on. Um, and I think on a slightly different note as well, maybe naively so, but I hope that the focus is um, down south in parliament at the moment about the sexist culture and the general disrespect between politicians Maybe it won't change a thing, but I certainly hope that it will and that people, it's brought to light that just because you have different political opinions does not mean that you can disrespect one another. So I hope that carries, carries through. Thank you, Oh, sorry. Go <laughs> <laughs> um, We got yeah, another question from the floor. Sorry, can we, can you, can you, oh, sorry. No, 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 we're, the, we're, we're recording this and I need to hand the microphone. Oh, sorry. We'll get to you, sorry. We'll do this gentleman first and then we'll get to you, okay? I, I thanks very much. Um, I think if we're uh, wanting to find out what our local politicians and our local council uh, thinks about the environment, 
and how serious uh, the individuals in the council is about the environment. Um, you know, they can talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? I think the best place to start a litmus test is to consider the nature of the environment we all have to live in. Uh, the environment that Falkirk Council, to a large extent, is a responsibility for maintaining. And <clears throat> the scheme I live in, uh, which is Hall Glen, by the way, uh, over the past 15 or so years, in terms of its upkeep, its cleanliness, uh, and its, uh, the efficiency of waste disposal, over that period of time, has gone down and down and down to the point where bins are getting missed because they're contaminated. Rubbish is left lying in the streets. Folk have clearly got a problem with managing the recycling regime that the council has. And having been involved in the trade union in the council for over about 40 years, retired now, it's no surprising the support that should have been coming from the council to help folk with that is no longer there because the council has been cut two ribbons over, the, over that period of time. So the place is in a mess. We've got folk that can't cope. We've got communal flats with communal bins that have been used by traders to fly tip in and nothing gets done. There's no visible improvement despite the protest and despite the comment. So we hear great comments tonight, and they're all good by the way, about how positive they're about the environment. But what about the environment we live in? What about the environment the council is ultimately responsible? Along with us, for trying to keep clean and tidy and safe. If we can't do that bit, then what chance have we got to up in the Philippines and other, any other parts along the way? If we're there, about the environment of the council. Thank you. I'm just going to just to clarify you in case that someone did ask, you can ask the panel whether you use on flight dipping. So that's pretty much the same question. Um, I'm going to start with James. Yes, um, it's the conservative philosopher Roger Scrutin who said that beauty is at the heart of conservatism. And I think that doesn't only rely to architecture and art, but it is the natural environment. Uh, and where it is beautiful, conservatives want to conserve it. Where it's not as beautiful, we want to raise the standard. So it's at the level where we conserve it. And I think, yes, promoting beauty and promoting uh, clean streets is something that should be at the heart of uh, conservative policies, definitely, but at the heart of every uh, political party policy. Uh, I do think um, you were talking about uh, a disintegrated approach. I, I do think um, literacy on the environment and um, it's not an afterthought. Laura's been mentioning this tonight as well. It just cannot be a second thought. It has to be at the forefront um, of, of council policy and council literacy. And when I uh, did the report on local authorities uh, in Scotland and their action on climate change, literacy was one of the big issues that we found. They thought that you could employ a climate change expert and then that would solve the problem rather than train every councillor, every member of staff to ensure that they put uh, environmental literacy at the forefront of what they are doing. Uh, and I uh, hope uh, that Public Council continues to do that and continues to uh, roll it out because that's um, very important. Uh, and on recycling rates, we do have a 10% lower rate of recycling in Falkirk than we do in Stirling. So what are Stirling doing that Falkirk Council can learn? What are other local authorities doing that Falkirk Council can learn? We don't have to think uh, outside the box, the dramatic new form, we have to learn from other places and engage with them and implement those strategies here in Falkirk. Laura? And, you know, absolutely 100% agree with, you know, that our local communities um, where we live are extremely important. And that is why we have invested heavily in um, having a new litter strategy um, where fly tipping is. And we had a, a fly tipping panel um, and, you know, the policies that came forward from that have 
resulted in you know things like you know we've, we've got new strategies like where when you've got the cctv uh, that is getting rolled out the mobile cameras to try to uh, detect and uh, issue penalty notices but also initiatives so that it can get lifted off of private land which was always a, a problem in the past um, and we're you know working through that um, and and there are actually quite a lot in our manifesto about uh, you know how we're going to be moving forward but we've already done an incredible amount to try to empower our communities and I'll be going out on Sunday with the Karen Shore letter pickers who themselves organized and have, have benefited from the letter strategy that Falkirk Council put in place to get materials themselves to organize themselves to say this is what's important to us in our community and we want to do this and that's the same whether it's in Earth, whether it's in uh, Kinnaird, whether it's in all the local communities across the board and it's a partnership approach it's like yeah, yes we had a very ambitious and we took an awful lot of heat about our burgundy bins and um, but we were one of the first to bring forward and be that, uh, you know, uh, charter compliant, we charter compliant, because we knew that co-mingling of recycling was something that would make, make our recycling rates, was making our recycling rates go down, and therefore we wanted to do something about it. Not necessarily an easy thing to sell to the public, having an extra bin, um, but we were ambitious and we put that in, and other councils are looking to us on that as well. So let's not do Falkirk down. Yes, there's always more that we can do, and it's a, a strategy which is multifaceted, um, but ultimately, it's also about, you know, involving everybody from the school children, but also not letting people off the hook either. People need to take personal responsibility. And rather than blaming the council sometimes, which is what happens a lot, where people say, what are the council doing about this? The problem is with the people who are perpetrating the fly tipping. We need to be less compromising with them as well. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's there's a, it's multifaceted, of course. Like there's not just one answer. Um, and although I commend the work that was being done, I don't think that CCTV and looking out for the culprits is the answer. I don't think for the amount that that would cost the results. I don't think it balances out. You know, people are smart and they will wait or they will go somewhere else. So I think you need to be taking a different approach from that. Um, you know, I think we all know at this point that austerity is a political choice. And we know if we invest in our communities, it saves us in the long run. So we would be encouraged and, you know, if we can get the bins uplifted more regularly, yes, it is costing more, but then you're spending less on fly tipping. Same with special uplifts or making sure that the recycling center is accessible and people can get there. And yes, there will always be individuals who will fly tip, but let's make sure that people aren't feeling forced in early, they don't have other options and it's just easier to get rid of at the sides of the roads. I think that we would do well to listen to the community councils as well, because I think a lot of people in their own area have insight to where the hotspots are or where the issues are arising. So I think you really need to tap into like community knowledge on that as well. And I think just what the gentleman was saying about our environment, the place where we're living, we also need to be aware, in addition to rubbish, we need to be protecting our green spaces and making sure that we have nature corridors as well so that we're increasing biodiversity and keeping nature protected. So um, before I moved uh, through here a few months ago, um, I kind of split my time between Argyle and Butte and uh, Western Bartonshire. Um, in Western Bartonshire, um, I saw great work being done by um, uh, by local community groups um, who were actively litter picking and working with the uh, and the council worked with them to uplift um, uplift the stuff that they picked up. And it's good to hear that that's happens through here as well. Um, in our Gail and Butte, um, and specifically Tarbot, Arachar, uh, and our Louis, we had a. Uh, I was part of um, uh, the local community forum, which brought together representatives of the community council, community development trust, um, representatives from the council, um, local MSP, um, people from, you know, all parts of the, all parts of the village and all political parties to address key environmental issues. Um, mainly around derelict land that was attracting littering, vandalism, uh, fly tipping, and antisocial behaviour. Um, and this forum basically is getting all the key you know, the people who know what's happening on the ground and representatives of the council and uh, agencies into a room 
it was really helpful and actually sort of helping to kind of drive forward courses of action that might potentially tackle some of these issues, identify the three key issues that could potentially make some of the biggest differences um, in these areas. And for places like Hall Glen, that might be something that's worth looking at. Um, as far as flight tipping goes as well, I was also involved with uh, the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime. Uh, again, interagency approach but, uh, between uh, local authorities, uh, the uh, Police Scotland um, and um, other public agencies and landowners. Um, and flight tipping was an issue that they approached with, um, with great zeal and enthusiasm. Um, and again, I think something similar at a Falkirk level might be, might be appropriate. Um, I think we do need to look at enforcement, um, but um, at, a national, at a national level, penalties need to be tougher. It's far too easy for, for fly tippers to skate by. Um, and I think the proceeds from fines that do get handed out for fly tipping needs to go into a remediation fund so that it's not the council and landowners who are being left carrying the can for the, these fly tippers' actions. Uh, the gentleman at the front here had a question. Well, yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly touch on that. Um, you, you said that we're all working together, all the parties, it's quite good to hear he's all talking from the same room, but, but uh, will we divide that up just now when we talk about um, the, the nuclear issue? Um, I know that Michael Matheson is the energy minister here at the local MSP, and uh, I don't think it's right that Scotland should be paying for England's um, development of nuclear energy. We don't want it, and we especially don't want their waste. So I, uh, I just want you to know what your party's feelings were, or personal feelings were on that. Whether Scotland should say that they're not going to be given any funding towards this English nuclear energy programme. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I had totally forgotten who went first last time. You went first? Okay, so Flora, thanks. Um, so, Again, it's not something which as a local councillor uh, can make a decision on. However, uh, in principle, um, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm not for uh, nuclear power. Uh, and I think that it's not even just, you know, not being for nuclear power. It's if we, if we are diverted from the potential of the technologies which we have for solar, for wind power, for, uh, you know, grounds, for also, there's, all, there's other technologies in the pipeline as well. And we look to that, not only is it a red herring and incredibly expensive and, you know, takes a long time to develop, um, there is no long-term solution to what you do with the waste. Um, I kind of liken it to, you know, it's like, for me, if when you, when you've got your children and they take all the toys out of the box and they keep taking them out of the box and they have no plan for ever putting them away again. You say, do you know what? This is not sustainable. You know, we are effectively just continuing in the same way that we have this mindset about consumerism where if we just consume and we consume and consume somewhere down the line, there will be a technological solution to get us out of it. No, at some point you have to draw the line. You see, sustainability is about actually looking at what the resources we have, what we need, how can we reduce, how can we use when we do need to use fossil fuels or we do need to use, uh, you know, consume things from new. How do we do that? And for everything else, how do we reduce? How do we reduce? How do we reuse? Um, and for me, nuclear power is just the ultimate, you know, um, on the never never. Um, yes, I think it's played a part in the past, um, unsurprisingly, from your point of view of saying should we pay for, for you know, England investing in something else? No, I don't think so, but that is part of something that can't do at council. Um, but no, I think it, it's something we need to be fairly clear on. We don't need it and we don't want it. Thank you. Huh? Yeah, it's a short answer, not a fan. Um, I'm torn on this one because nuclear, the advantage of it is obviously that you do not generate carbon dioxide from nuclear power. And that is so important in what we're trying to achieve going forward. That's one of the, I mean, one, cutting carbon dioxide is one of the biggest things we need to do in order to, in order to hit our net zero targets and to get us out of this climate emergency. Um, I also, and I'm also conscious that you, I talked earlier about the variability in the output from wind and solar. Um, now, there are other ways you can uh, 
moderate what uh, you can provide your base load electricity and you can compensate for what's uh, what's on the grid you can put in interconnectors between uh, the UK and other parts of uh, other parts of Europe or even Africa there's talk of a connector to Morocco and um, so that if the sun's not shining here you can bring in energy renewable energy from elsewhere battery energy to help balance the load and um, I've mentioned hydrogen as well although that's not really so great from generating energy perspective that's more for replacing uh, petroleum however you, on, on a plus side the technology exists and although it does take a lot it does take a long time to build and operate a nuclear power plant it's it's something that exists in the toolbox just now um so I think it's something that is probably part of the solution in the short to in the short to medium term. The typical nuclear reactor has a lifespan of about, I think it's about 40 odd years. So it may well be something that in that time frame has to be a part of the solution until we can uh, until we can until we can bring other solutions in. Um, if the alternative is to keep burning, sorry, if the alternative is to keep burning gas. It might it might be something we have to look at. I do think we need to differentiate between big nuclear power plants and small nuclear modular energy, which is being rolled out across brands. Um, it's got a much quicker roll-up time, so you're not waiting five, seven years for construction, and it's also got a much lower uh, rate of waste as well. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of environmental uh, scientists who, who back this uh, policy as a way to get off oil and gas uh, and use that as the, the stopgap between getting sustainable, uh, renewable energy. Uh, that is the ultimate goal. That's where we want to get. And we do need to invest to get there um, as quick as we can. But the answer is not here just now. And if it's between oil and gas and small uh, nuclear modular energy, then I think small nuclear mod uh, modular energy is by far uh, more environmentally friendly. Uh, it's easy to get out. Uh, compared to big nuclear power plants and the waste is much smaller and it is actually cheaper as well when you compare it to the big nuclear power plants. So I think that's the approach that the UK government should be taking if we do go down the nuclear route rather than the big nuclear power plants that uh, we are currently talking about. Thank you. We're going to move to the closing statements now. We're coming up on time. Uh, okay, one quick question. One question. This is a comment. I've been so impressed by the fact, apart from the nuclear, <laughs> I've been so impressed by the fact that we're hearing the same things from you, and you're agreeing with each other, and you're nodding to each other. And I think if that could only happen in the council all the time, because Falkirk Council has a reputation for um, not getting on, for, for missing opportunities because of infighting. And you look at things like places like North Ayrshire Council and what they have achieved. You look at places like Dunbar and what it's achieved and Dundee. I beg you. Let me have a council that I can be truly proud of, that is leading the way in the fight for climate justice. And thank you very much. It's been a fascinating evening. Thank you. Well, it's been nice. We can move to closing statements. And we'll start with. Yeah, so I am a relative newcomer to the game. Um, so, you know, I'm not an expert in all of these fields, but what I am is passionate about prioritising climate change, um, the climate emergency. It's the reason, it is the number one reason why I want to get involved in local council. Um, the change that we need isn't coming from the top and it isn't coming fast enough. So I do think that the, the larger the focus it is at a local level, the more action we can see take place. 
in real time and in our communities, which I think is vital. Um, I want to be in the room where the decisions are getting made that are on local policy level. And, you know, I've not got the track, right, the backgrounds in politics, but I hope that my personal credentials, you know, I've been involved in tree planting and litter picking, and it is something that I'm passionate about. Um, so, yeah, I just hope that following on from this, that I've been able to answer your questions as best as I can, and I hope I get an opportunity to get involved in the process more. Next, um, by saying thank you very much for having me. Um, it's been really good to take your questions and to kind of put our case across. Um, I appreciate maybe able to agree on absolutely everything, particularly the nuclear question. Um, albeit that's not really going to fall within council remit, so hopefully that won't put you uh, put you off us too much. Um, but it has been good to be a part of this today, and um, uh, you know this is actually my first first time standing as a candidate as well, and it's my first hustings. So um, and it was uh, I was I wasn't sure if we were all going to end up at each other's throats, and I'm quite glad at how this is actually uh, that has panned out, and I'm glad that this is an issue that unites us so much. Um, I um, it, this. The climate emergency is something that, that I am I, I'm very passionate about doing something to resolve. It's why I moved to, uh, it's why I moved through here to take the job in the renewable industry. Um, it's something that I thought I could actually make a difference in. This is something that I also think I can make a, a difference in by being a part of Falkirk Council. Um, and I yeah, I really want to work for you and try and make this place a place even better to live than it is. Um, and I also commit that. Um, if you do vote for Liberal Democrat councillors on your ward and then even do get elected or any of us get elected, um, then we want to be cooperative. You know, we want to work towards these shared goals that we have. So, yeah, we very much want to carry on in the spirit of tonight and uh, continue uh, continue working to uh, working together. So um, thank you very much. And um, I can be reached at um i could be reached through the falkirk liberal democrats uh, facebook page if you have any further questions or want to um uh, want to discuss anything and um, if you reach out to us through that um then um they'll pass you on to me and i'd be very happy to have a further conversation with any of you thank you james thank you uh, thank you um all for the invite today and thanks to uh, friends uh, there for uh, hosting uh, this very important uh, conversation um I've tried to get across that um, beauty, conserving uh, and empowering local communities is at the heart of my conservatism tonight. And uh, that is what motivates my politics. It's why the first research project that I did with Stephen Kerr was specifically on uh, how are the local authorities throughout Scotland uh, dealing with the climate emergency in front of us. And with that report, I worked with experts in this field uh, and I do uh, I, that knowledge uh, I've managed to absorb some of it I need to absorb more um, but uh, that's uh, what who we should be listening to as well as local people uh, and we should uh, keep in mind that all the decisions that we make as a council will impact and affect local people and that's why um, I believe that on issues where we agree on 95 percent of the stuff we have to put party politics aside, uh, I, uh, if I am elected, I will be new blood with fresh ideas and I will have that spirit of cooperation uh, on the climate, on Falkirk Town Centre and all the other um, issues that will come uh, to the council in the years ahead. And uh, so, yeah, that uh, is my commitment. It's also the commitment exactly. of the public Conservatives. Uh, and if you vote for us next week and we are elected, that's the spirit uh, that's, uh, that we will go into the public council with. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's, it's been good, you know, we've, I think we've tried to keep a respectful tone and to be positive, and that is important. Um, and I sense, you know, I'm certainly, I would include myself as being a bit of an environmental enthusiast, um, or uh, maybe slightly stronger, but it's not just up to the environmental enthusiasts within each of our parties to be the ones sitting here being passionate about it. We need to take everybody in our own parties, everybody in our own groups, everybody across the chamber together to stop seeing things as 
environmental policies that sit on their own. So that does mean, yes, on town centre. Town centre and the building is not about town centre and the building, it's about saying it's important to get people back living in town centres to have 20 minute neighbourhoods to integrate into local services to try and reduce our carbon footprint that way. It's about saying, yes, having action on fuel poverty is about uh, you know, the cost of living and about poverty, but it's also about energy and energy security. It's about the just transition. It's about local jobs. Invest it's not an either or. It's not investment or the environment. It's not picking up the bins or doing the fly tipping and having biodiversity. They're all integrated from procurement to uh, waste to taxi policy. It doesn't matter what it is. They're all environmental policies because they all have an impact. And having a vision which is what we have to implement that and um, to take Excellent. ambition forward um, and put policies in place that are tested and, and, and put forward that is what we are hoping to do and yes of course to work with everybody to make sure that we, we get the best deal for everybody in Falkirk but the planet as well thank you thank you thanks everyone for coming out it's been great I really enjoyed this um, if you want to find more information like I said before we've got a stall at the back there with uh, information leaflets, membership forms, um, and you can check us out on foe.scot. We've got information on all our campaigns uh, and loads and loads of resources for everybody. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Switch the path there. Yeah, that's...